So, buona dies, amigos. Добрый вечер, добрый день, дорогие друзья. And hello and good afternoon, everybody. Those three languages can hear on the streets of Havana. So here we see the Cuban flag, and it has very deep meaning into it. And so the three blue stripes represent the states in which Ireland was divided at the time, which was 1849. White color represents the purity. The red triangle represents the bloodshed for the pursuit of the freedom. And the star represents as a symbol of freedom between the nations. So we're going to talk about photography in general before we talk about underwater photography and go over our trip and some of the logistics with Cuba. As everybody knows, Cuba until recently was very difficult for US citizens to get to. Uh, this was in August. This was our second time there. We were there three years ago. We were there this past August. Even though Cuba is only 90 miles from Miami, when we went in August, we were sort of pioneers. We had to go by a charter plane, and that charter flight was close to uh, $1,000 uh, for that flight. Plus, they really would charge you for every ounce of luggage, which as underwater photographers is a real problem because we carry lots and lots of gear. Now, there are commercial flights from many cities, including United from Newark, uh, JetBlue from Kennedy, uh, that go nonstop to, um, to Havana. Uh, luggage fees are just like going to any Caribbean island. You still need a reason to go to Cuba. So on the airline's website, there's an affidavit. You fill that out. There's 12 reasons on why Americans could go to Cuba on that. The two that most people pick is either a people-to-people -people education license or a workshop license. Um, coming up, we're going to be giving photo workshops, so that would be one of the reasons you could go. Avalon Cuba Dive Centers, which is who we dove with, they could support those two reasons for going to Cuba. Also, you need to have a visa that's just not Americans, that's everybody entering the country and you need to have health insurance. You could get both of that when you buy your ticket to go to Cuba. On the streets of Havana, you can see different kinds of cars, Americans and Russians, and also with different kinds of uh, driving plates. To photograph the cars, they're just beautiful, a great subject, but you still want to make it interesting. So we would use different lenses. In this case, I was shooting with a fisheye lens coming in very close. And that photo I took with a wide angle that allows me to show the space around the car. And that photo I took with fisheye, which allows even show more space and also slightly exaggerates the shapes of the car, which was my purpose for that photo. I have that car in my garage. It's a 69 today. <laughs> We want to say that all the questions and the remarks would like to have yeah, after. Yeah, remarks we'll do afterwards because, because it's we're a live streaming. So, but, but thank you. So here I'm showing the um, American car, and my style is actually also shooting through the puddles as as showing as a mirror reflection. Olga likes to use water even when she's not scuba diving. I just like get dirty and wet. <laughs> so how do you do these? Literally, I would say you have to be in really good shape. Make sure your knees do not hurt, your back doesn't hurt, your hips kind of all together. So of course you have to go and really squat down deep. Sometimes you have to get on your rear or sometimes you have to go on your belly. So usually when I go on this kind of photo shooting, I put my kind of clothes that I don't have to care for much. So it's another photo of the, of the cars and uh, very popular among the people who uh, visit Havana. I'm not big on getting on the ground in city streets, but I enjoy photographing all the people, watching Olga as she's laying down, <laughs> taking photographs with her camera almost in the puddle without the housing. So another photo that shows, actually it's uh, not far away from the uh, Havana University, and it was right after the rain, and it was showing again the old car, and again this also shows the space of the city, how big it is, and it's called uh, architecture. So doing a little bit of a different technique instead of with the puddles, 
Here we were standing across the street from Moreau Fortress on the Matacan, which is a main street that goes along the ocean. And what I was doing is close to dusk, when it was getting a little bit dark, I would use a slow shutter speed. So I was able to get the blur of the car, but still pop a flash to get a sharp image and a blur image at the same time. Also, while shooting the cars, you want to come in and show the details. We're trying to tell a story, a story of our trip. So we want everything to look a little bit different. Use different lenses, come in close at times. So passing by the streets of Havana, you will notice that a lot of doors are open because they do not have air conditioner. So they use the natural air as a way of ventilation the apartments. And you would see in surprise how much stuff you can see, like this car that actually the, the hallway was used as a park garage. spot, yeah, garage for this uh, blue car. But it also looks to me like they painted the hallway to match their car. <laughs> or painted your car. <laughs> There's another way of means to travel in Havana, and there's a yellow pedicab, pedicabs that we took uh, once for a ride. It was very bumpy because of the small uh, tires, but they were really fast, and it was fun. A lot of the old American cars are taxi cabs. Uh, they call them yank tanks down there. So most people do not own any kind of cars, so they own bicycles or motorcycles like this family passing by uh, Havana University on your left. So here we could see the cars you, 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 know, you will encounter in Havana. It's uh, American Chevrolet and Russian Jubilee. Many of the American cars, they use Russian parts since the cars are so old and up until recently, and even now, they can't get US parts in there. And that's a lot like us. Here you got a Russian and American standing in front, just like these cars. Yes, that's how it goes. Uh, again, after the rain, uh, getting down dirty, uh, I took this photo of the Great Theater of Havana, which is an old but beautiful building, and at night it obviously shows its beauty even more. Art and performing arts is very important to the Cuban culture. Uh, this is sort of like our Carnegie Hall. It's the same building, but uh, at dusk, so we have some available daylight. And it looks differently from different uh, angle, but still very majestic. I decided to shoot the building once the yellow lights were on, waiting for one of the um, US cars to go by. And I like that we have the yellow lights in the building and a yellow checker cab went by. So this is a coin, Cuban coin, that represents the engraving of uh, Castle Moro that is fortress uh, guarding the um, entrance to Havana Bay. And we will talk more in further in our photos why it's so important. So this is the back of the coin. It tells it's Republica de Cuba. So this is the uh, fortress itself, we just saw on the coin. And it shows the cannons and sculpture to, devoted to General uh, Miranda and also using the reflections uh, and double uh, getting the reflection image from the puddle. Shows even more uh, graduate of this. Uh, Photographing port. at night, at one point we ended up in a um, heat lightning storm. Now at B&H we do sell lightning triggers. That would make it really easy. When the lighting goes off, it will fire the shutter. We didn't have them, and we did have tripods with us, but they were back in the apartment. So here we are in the dark with light, lightning going. Uh, there were these metal poles right near the fortress. So we balanced the cameras on the metal poles, yes, while lightning was, was going, and, per, and would open the shutters as the lightning would strike. We were pretty lucky that as the night went on, the lightning was pretty intense. So you would get, it was almost like a pre-flash. You would get one strike and then two other strikes. So we would open the shutter and hope we would get the strike, and we did well. I guess it was kind of suicidal, but we survived. <laughs> so I like this photo, again, uh, the, the Fort uh, Moreau on the back, and this old Russian Lada, it's another type of uh, Russian car that we imported to Cuba. And it's a you know, parallel of the history of old cars and the fort itself. Uh, I like shooting moon. It's one of my obsessions. 
So we're wandering the streets of Havana, and as you know, the uh, Spanish architecture also, they have this balcony with interesting guards and design. So I, I refocused the camera on the moon, and I kind of pulled within the uh, available space and created that image. So the, the guards itself obviously are the focus, because the, 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 the moon was my main focus, and that's how I created this image. Since we were there three years ago, we see that Havana is really cleaning up. Lots of renovations, lots of changes, now that it's much easier for US citizens to go there. So this, um, the Pardo, this road goes from their Central Park all the way to the Matacone. A uh, very important street socially. Everybody's outdoors, families, friends, a lot of street music going on. There are benches on every block and these uh, lion sculptures on every block. I decided to use a fisheye, come in close, very close to the lion sculpture, use some fill flash to bring out the detail, but balanced it so we got nice lighting and you get to see the whole street. It's uh, like our Broadway, people come out and socialize and purchase. That's right, people were selling crafts, et cetera, out on this street. So the Museum of the Revolution, which used to be a palace before, uh, and the tank that symbolizes the, the, the freedom that came from Bay of Peaks, and they claimed that Fidel Castro himself was in this leading tank. So going in the streets of Havana, you could see a lot of billboards with the scenes uh, from Cuban Revolution. Here, Fidel Castro on the right himself with a close friend at the time. Uh, uh, Camila Cifayegos, who was a poet and a writer, and the small scene of uh, people greeting the uh, revolutionaries. Now on this billboard, wasn't in Havana, when we were going to the tobacco growing area and going to the caves, this was there with this depiction of Shea. The other billboard was on Revolution Square. So Revolution Square very, very big area with government buildings around it. Here we have the depiction of Shea on one of the buildings. And the same uh, depiction of uh, Che Guevara at night at the, after the rain. And I still, working at B&H, I'm pretty sure this is Moish, one of the buyers on the third <laughs> floor. But it is Camille Sofriegas, the poet and writer. I kept looking and going, what is he doing on one of the buildings in Havana? So the Bacardi building, when the revolution came, before that, Bacardi rum was based in Cuba, not Puerto Rico. They had to leave. Just before they had to leave, they built this beautiful Art Deco building, which uh, the Cuban people are still very proud of. You go to Havana and everybody goes, you got to see the Bacardi building. So we wanted to try to photograph it different ways. I used a normal lens, got across the street, framed it with the archway that I was standing in across. So again, using my wide angle, I wanted to show the full length of the building and the streets on the side. And that's what it is, through the dirty puddle. And when we talk about going and uh, uh, what kind of lens you should bring with you, everything that you have on you. So showing the wide angle of the building and the full scale, you also want to show the details, like the uh, logo of the company is the bat. So I have to use my telephoto lens for that purpose. And talking about mix of architecture style in Havana, this is one I'm not sure about how to describe but yet it has some kind of meaning to it and looking kind of bizarre, but I like the clouds on the back and creates a very dramatic image. So on the first day we arrived and I was so happy to see the rain coming down. It poured. I love the bad weather, to tell you honestly. So, uh, and it was at dusk, getting dark, and that was the Hawaiian University that we saw the first building. So this sculpture of this homeless gentleman uh, was put by the women of Havana because he symbolizes the real quality of a, a gentleman. He was the homeless man wandering the streets of Havana and seeing every woman that he encountered and he was always able to give the nice compliments, how beautiful you are, I love your dress, I love your shoes, I love your handbag, and women just love this guy. So in memory of this gentleman, they put this sculpture. Also, uh, we were so surprised 
that pleasantly surprised when we first time in 2013 and three years later, the art and culture scene had changed so much for better. So this is the uh, Fabrica de Arte we were recommended to go and visit at night. And it was a long line of people and locals. And uh, they had so, it's like a big workhouse with uh, a lot of stages, video installations, art installations, installations, uh, live music, lots of bars, and summer uh, 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 park. Yeah, for, there were some outside areas, and you have art, music, and mojitos. You it looked like a Soho, Soho downtown. It's, it was amazing. Uh, being more traditional with the jazz that we know from Cuba, uh, Buena Vista Social Club was. Havana was their home, then Ry Cooter brought them on world tour, including into the Beacon Theater on the Upper West Side. Olga and I didn't know each other then, but in talking in Cuba the first time, we were both at the Beacon to see uh, Buena Vista Social Club. And my son, ago. who sits right in the front row, he was with me at the time. He remembers that probably. He was a little guy, but it was a fantastic music. Also throughout the square and on the promenade, you hear lots of street music also makes interesting images. A lot of music you can hear uh, going to different venues, like this one in uh, Settle uh, Hotel. Right, and here the um, Jazz Cafe. We saw this really high energy Cuban Afro band. Now might be a good time to talk about the finances and money when you're in Havana. Um, the locals use uh, the Cuban peso, which is one amount of money, and that uh, they only get paid anywhere from 28 to 35 pesos a month. Foreigners need to use what they call a cook. So it's an exchange rate peso, and the cook is basically a dollar is worth one cook. The thing is, is when you exchange your money, they do take 20%, but that's only for US dollars. We decided to bring euros. So if you bring euros or Canadian dollars, then it's one to one, or the, ex the rate exchange rate without that 20% tax. Uh, while we were there, you had to pay with cooks. In the couple months that we haven't been there, a lot of the restaurants now will accept American dollars, but they still take that 20%. When we were there, credit cards were not even an option. Now, some of the restaurants, some of the places say they will take credit cards, but since the internet's so bad, they usually can't connect to the bank and say that it's not working. So when you go and visit, bring cash. And it would be much better to bring euros or Canadian dollars and do the exchange. A lot of music in the streets, and that the location should go when you when you in Havana. That's the art school with all the beautiful art installation outdoors. And these girls from the art school they play music and dance for three hours in a hot, humid weather. But it's really worth seeing it and listening. And that's the shows the uh, of the scene of that particular place. So when you walk the streets of Havana in the rainy season, you can see a lot of puddles, a lot of reflections, just you know normal plastic life. We'll talk a little bit about photographing the people. It's always good to ask permission. Most people want to be photographed. There's a few people who say, no, please don't take my photograph. Uh, Olga and I both really like this gentleman's luck. We decided to handle it differently. I used a wider angle lens, photographed him as the columns receded and his friends in the background. And I was attracted to this face because he was so such distinguished. And the look in, he, in the, uh, of his eyes, beautiful. The nose, the shape of everything of his face. And uh, he's just a handsome guy. So I used my telephoto lens for that. <laughs> now, these ladies, this is their business. Yes. Uh, they were there three years ago. They were there now. Some friends of ours that were in Havana two years before our first time, they were there. But look how photographic and the Cuban cigars. I went, I tipped them, it wasn't enough, they came after me. <laughs> so it's always good to have some change and a fair amount of change to uh, take care of your models. Um, again, we saw this couple, all the couple, and mostly what I liked this guy's name, he, he had a beautiful blue eyes, uh, kind face, 
and he did not mind me to come over and take a photo of them. I mean, I give them the money, but then they never ask for that, and they just were glad to pose for us. Through the square, not only music, but lots of art and arts and crafts. Uh, this woman, the, you know, we talked to her. This was what she did. She made these dolls, went out on the square, and sold them. Passing by, and saw the uh, soon-to-be uh, young mother, and across her, the uh, mural of Che Guevara gave me the parallel of the past and the future. So the people are very much fun to photograph. When we were going between uh, dive destinations, we stopped at a little farm. They were telling us all about their lives in the farm. Everybody wanted to be photographed except this little child. This child's like looking at me like, what are you doing? Go away. Also, you will see a lot of stray cats and dogs. So what we did every time we went out for, uh, for, uh, for, for dinner, we asked our waiter to give us a catty or doggy bag so we can feed those poor souls. Small like, uh, stores like our dailies, but there's no food. And it's very dark. And they always have these billboards where the locals come and they look how much they can have per month, per person, per household. And when we ask what is probably my friend Sonia, she knows Spanish, but I was told that it's pretty simple items that were available to the people. It's like oil, butter, bread, salt, sugar, that pretty much was it. Maybe potatoes and onions, that was it. Unlike a supermarket here, these little stores are also very dimly lit. So while we were inside, I just enjoyed seeing the bright light coming in from the street into this very dark room. But nowadays you can see a lot of farmers come into the city and they'll sell their goods. Again, after the rain, uh, we are on Malacon, and it's the, mo the most social location you can find in Havana. There are people, young and older, doesn't matter what, they come and they socialize, they dance, and they fish. All the way till sunset and through the night. Yeah. So now it's time to leave the city and go into the country. For our um, first dive destination, we dove around the Bay of Pigs area. So that was about a three hour bus ride that took us to this little cabin area. And then we had to take one of these little boats through the canals into open water where our liveaboard ship was gonna be. So we started very slow because this was very narrow and then, as you could see, that's, the, that's where we're going. And, and it then, was like a roller coaster. It was really fast. It was pretty much that all the way to open water. Now, it was very hot, so going that fast, the wind felt very comfortable. And but it made some of us look a little funny. <laughs> that's me. I was really happy to get some fresh air into my face. It was very hot. <laughs> it's very humid and hot. So, after, so we ended up in uh, Avalon's uh, living board called Georgiana. And here I'm using the wide angle. And I did the split shot. So this way we can see the bottom of the ves vessel and the top. And I love the bubble on the right. It's my favorite spot. Even though we're on a liveaboard, we did take some excursions onto the islands. These are all uninhabited where we were. So you could see just beautiful white sand beaches with some conch shells. This is the boat that we ended up diving on. The liveaboard boats are where we're living, but we're not diving off of them. These little boats will come and either take us to the islands or take us out diving. So we were on one of the islands, and we were promised to see some local birds, which were now the turn, and we found few nests of these juveniles. Another popular bird, white ibis, you can find sometimes on the roads. This one actually jump on a tree and post for me at the sunset. And hutia, they're adorable, they're cute, they're very friendly, they look like big rats. And they were almost dis uh, extinguished because Cubans love their delicious meat. But now they're under the government protection. Well, they are in this area. In this area, yes, only in this area. And you could see they wouldn't be hard to hunt since they're not shy. <laughs> oh, wow. 
they came out, they greeted us, they were, you know, they loved the food we brought to them. How much they weighed, did they? They bought, uh, I would say, food and a half size, well, well fed, well maintained, and they just love fresh water because the water around them only salt water. So I brought my water with the, I mean, water bottle with the fresh water and just shared with them. Olga's hand, feed, uh, hand feeding this one water. We're always saying this one was the scout checking out what we were bringing. Yeah. He was on the, one of the local guards. Also on the island, coexisting with them are many different iguanas, <clears throat> which also almost went extinct because they were being hunted for food. But now they're safe in the small island. Also very friendly. They love tomatoes, they love all kinds of fruits we give them. Now notice behind him there's this hermit crab. And they were just rolled hundreds of them under our feet. Interesting ecosystem between these three animals on this island. So between dive destinations, again, when we stopped at that farm, it was interesting to see the pigs that they were farming. Now, most Caribbean islands, fish is the staple food. In Cuba, it's, it's pork. That's their main dish, even though I would hate to see that cute little thing turn into bacon. <laughs> So we asked the local farmers, and they really go only by one specific animal, domestic animals, either the cows, or the horses, or the pigs, or, cow, or geese, ducks, and uh, chickens. chickens. Back in Russia, I came from Russia, I guess you can hear by my accent, we kind of had pretty much everything, domestic-wise. I thought you were from Canada. Well, I was told once, yes. <laughs> of course, a lot of tobacco is grown for the cigars, we were there off season, so they were growing corn instead of tobacco, but this gentleman's in the hut that's used to dry the tobacco for the cigars. Right at that farm, they make the cigars fresh. And that man has been there for years, and that's his specialty. And it's the best cigar you can buy from that guy, or any places that you know, have these people make right the cigars in the front of you. We so, go ahead. so go ahead. We just want to show a little bit of the countryside in this tobacco area, which led to this very interesting cave. So the cave actually was well lit up. Now it's made for uh, vi visitors like uh, us. And it's uh, really big and beautiful. You could see the scale by the gentleman standing there. After hiking through the cave, you come to a waterway. And there's little canal boats that you would get on that went much slower than the ones that we took to our dive boat. And they led us out of the cave. So we dove in mangroves about maybe 10, 15 feet depth. And so what's so good about it, not much of a fish, but just seeing the roots of the trees in the water and shooting up was very interesting experience. And I never seen that many upside down jellyfish. Mm -hmm. And that's why they call upside down because that's how they swim upside down. So now we're getting to the diving part and photographing water that's not in a puddle. Uh, the Bay of Pigs area, very healthy reefs as far as the coral growth and the sponge. Sponges, not that many fish, or not a, a lot of large fish that we saw, but the macro life was quite interesting, including this Patterson cleaning shrimp, which was only about yay big. He did have antennas almost as long as his body. And what he would do is he would move those antennas around, and that would attract bigger fish to come in to be cleaned. And arrow crop is a pretty common creature you can see in Caribbean waters. Flamingo tongue snail called flamingo for its uh, pink color, but it attaches itself to the corals, and the shape and uh, design is really beautiful. Um, these shrimps, including this banded coral shrimp, come out at night. So this was photographed at night. Again, rather small. We both shoot Olympus Micro Four Thirds cameras using 60 millimeter macro lenses, uh, which have an equivalent of 120 millimeter if we were shooting full frame. So with the really tiny subjects, they work well because we could get enough distance to do our lighting and not to scare the, uh, the, the subject. 
uh, Christmas tree worms, um, actually here they are, came with the different colors, as you could see. Uh, it's very, very difficult to photograph them for the reason that if you get too close, they will close up. So you have to choose the proper lens. If you get the wide angle lens, you get when I get too close, you're not gonna take pictures of them. But it's what I was taking also on a night uh, dive, and there were so many, and they were not afraid of my strobe lights going off. And this is a feather duster, warms just because it's beautiful, and I like the design and color of that and shapes. Now this blue chromis, he was tiny. Again, he was shot with a macro lens, only about yay big, but this fish has an attitude. He, look, he reminded me of the, the Napoleon, you know, what, the, I'm small, but I'm important. Mm -hmm. Also quite a number of dog snappers on the reef. Spanish grunts come in big schools and they usually float over the hard corals and that's how they can actually protect themselves and defend themselves. They kind of hide underneath if they see a big fish coming after them. The blue tangs, talk a little bit about the lighting. We always use two strobes. We try to use available light a lot of the times and just use the strobes to bring out the natural colors and fill in the shadows. In this case, I did use a faster shutter speed because I wanted the background to be darker so the blue of the fish would stand out more. King crab really has the right size name for, for its cell because it's a two foot size crab. So it's good to be king in his own Good to be king. Kingdom. He was a very large uh, crab. Other crustaceans were lobsters. Usually you see them they come out at night. The spiny lobster I did photograph during the day. And this is what during the night time. I mean, they're delicious, but we're not allowed to take them out. This is a protected, protected area. Um, they do some lobster fishing in this area commercially, but it's, it's, it's very regulated. On the boats we were on, we had lobster practically every night, but not the ones that we were able to take. Spotted drum fish, I call it the fish that has ADD, attention deficit disorder. It does not stop for a second. It just goes back and right, back and right, so it's very hard to take photo of that fish, so you get lucky if you... They also are in overhang, so usually it's hard to get, get it lit properly and with it moving back and forth, as Olga said. But this one was moving back and forth, but in kind of an open overhang, so we were able to get our lights in and get some nice photographs. Horn cowfish, a little creature, and it was also taken for the ananas dive. So when I saw, it, she looked like a leaf, just kind of floating in a, you know, between the gr grass weeds. And then she was kind of crawling. I'm like, I thought maybe it was a frogfish, but it was, it was a hornfish. And look at that lips and the eyes. Just, she just so adorable. What was your depth on the dive? Uh, that particular one? How deep was it? Uh, so our depth the on pillars, that dive pillars was? 25. It was very shallow, yeah, because we were shooting on the pillars, because pillars tend to have a lot of growth, marine life on it. Typically, most of the depths we were diving on both these sites were between 60 and 120 feet of water. A couple of the night dives, the pillar dives, as Olga said, was about 25. This, uh, with these parrotfish, was another night dive a little bit deeper, but not much, maybe about 40 feet. At night, the parrotfish try to get some sleep as we go in and start taking photographs. This one parrotfish was gigantic. He must have been about four feet long, and there I am with a 60 millimeter macro lens. So what do you do? You come in close and photograph the eye. That's what I did first, but I thought, let me see what I could get. That's where you get the eye contact because you know the eyes tell all. So I pulled back and at least I was able to get a headshot of him. I had to turn my strobe power up and just try to uh, work the image out a little bit better. In Photoshop, I did have to add contrast. Water has stuff in it and that's the reason you want to be as close to your subject as you possibly could. I was much further away than I would have liked to have been but we're shooting digital, we might as well experiment. If the photo wasn't good, I just wouldn't be showing it today. So I had, at the time, wide angle, 
and this a big barracuda came close to me and at that moment I, I, I thought I wish I could have my macro lens because she has a beautiful heavy uh, head and sharp teeth but with what angle could I show that because she still what angle is just too far although she was like one foot away from me but you know you compose the the, the photo with the uh, uh, backdrop as the coral head gives you a, de a decent image Peacock flounder, one of the many different kinds of flatfish. So they try to camouflage, they're in the sand. I decided to shoot over a little bit and uh, concentrate on the eye, which is kind of hard to see. There's the eye right there. They blend in really well. I would take my strobes and move them to the side and try to side light it as much as possible to pull out the texture so it would separate from the sand. So I had a different approach with my macro lens. I just wanted to show the fish within, you know, in their own environment with those seaweeds, and he hiding underneath between them. It's like a painting. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Mm -hmm. Now, all digital cameras these days will shoot video as well as stills. We shouldn't forget that. So I just had my images. I decided to turn my video, and I was so <laughs> pleasantly surprised what I caught on that video, which I had no idea that I would. So we see the flounder kind of floating in the, in the water, in mid water. And then he gets together with another flounder. You could see just right in a second. And that happened. Very intimate moment. I was so happy to record it. Look at that beauty. But not only did Olga record it with her macro lens. And so they just made it. On top of her main housing, she'll run a GoPro. So I have my plan A, B, and C. So my plan A, just steal photos. Something happened, I put my plan, plan a, B, which is a, the, the video on my main camera, which is just over the macro lens. But I also have attached a GoPro camera, which is a wide angle. So simultaneously, my GoPro was running as I turned on my main uh, camera video. And I could see, so it's wide angle, but you saw also Spatial space, and obviously you can see the whole action again here. Which is really great that Olga had the two cameras running because this happened so quickly. It was a real case of slam bam. Thank you, flounder. <laughs> so okay. these Spanish grunts. We did this wall where we're going to be showing shortly. Uh, Cayo Blanco, just a beautiful well-decorated wall, and on top of it was a huge school of Spanish grunts. We also had a team with us from National Geographic TV in Brazil. Uh, very nice people, good image makers, and looking at their housings, uh, Olga and I are never going to complain about the luggage that we have to take with us in a plane. Much more equipment. We do sell some of this at B&H, the Kagan Lights. We do uh, sell here. We no longer sell Gates housings. So in this photo, Larry's subject is uh, focused on the yellow sponge, and yet he used the dive guide as his model to show the scale of the wall that the sponge grows on, and also the bubbles that come actually from behind the diver put some energy in action. Usually we try to tell the people we photograph to hold your breath, and as divers here know, that's the main rule, don't hold your breath. But if you're not going up and down to do it for a second to take the photograph, it's okay. In this case, he exhaled, but since the bubbles aren't in front of his face, it turned into a successful shot. So this is another shot of Laris, and again, the main uh, focus is stovepipe sponge. So this time he asked the diver move far back, so this way that he will not lead well with the uh, strobes, and but still shows the scale of the of the sponge. So here, this photo, um, I used the one of the divers I asked for uh, to pose for me, and she was going through this little tunnel where this fantastic, uh, uh, very rare uh, soft sponge. Uh, grows, and I actually use the torch, as we say, that uh, it could be the blue light, could be just white light, or the red ones, which I was happy about it. And also show the negative space between the walls where the diver goes through and creates interesting image. 
on this wall, the seascape with the yellow tube sponge, I'm using my strobes to bring the natural colors out in the foreground. I use a shutter speed to determine whether I want a light or dark background, in this case a blue background. So I'm using kind of a fast shutter speed to get it a little bit on the dark side. Again, I moved the diver back so there's some detail in him. You could kind of see that he's looking at the whole scene here, but he's not overlit, so the attention goes to the front. I like this photo for the reason that I like the layers that build up and brings you to the surface. As you could see, the hot coral will lit up, and the yellow color coexists well with the other primer color as a blue color. And you could see the layer after layer, the, the, the hot coal itself, and then, then the wall, there's another layer of uh, wall, and then the blue color. It just kind of takes you to the depth and to the surface. Now on this photograph, I decided to use a slower shutter speed so I could get a lighter blue background. Uh, the Barracuda decided to swim by at the right moment uh, to be part of the composition, but what I'm concentrating on is the red encrusting sponge. What's interesting about this is these take over um, a dead piece of coral. So you see the dark area there. Uh, that's some coral that is no longer living, and the sponge is wrapping itself around it. So it's almost complete, but soon that whole area is going to be just the red sponge. So another seascape with a soft uh, sponge, and here, uh, Larry kind of uses uh, sh slow shutter speed to show the blue color. Sometimes it's, you, you can really, well, you, it's, up to, uh, it's up to you how you want to position the, the coral or a sponge and how you want to make it lighter or darker, the, the blue water. So on this one, the colony of membrane tunicates, I was about 107 feet depth, and uh, I looked down and I saw this uh, uh, tunicates, and I said, wow, it reminds me of some kind of Greek uh, in shape of the Greek uh, vase, and it was uh, once I saw this for the two weeks, so it was, I guess, it's pretty rare. Another pink uh, waste sponge, they're usually large size, and they grow mostly on the walls like this one. It's like a big horn coming out of the wall. And what's interesting about those uh, sponges, like this one, barrel sponge, because they have such a large space inside, a lot of small creatures find the space, then they just save home. So like this one also, uh, the sponge, and I see the arrow crab. Actually, for this one, I had a wide angle, unfortunately. So I came very close. I put my strobes close. I can lit up well. And, but yet, it's also, you see the sponge, and, but also the your main focus still on the arrow crab. You always see the arrow crab when you have the macro lens, when you have the wide angle lens on, and you always see the whale shark when you have the macro lens So you on. have to kind of... That's always going to happen. You know, just do your best, whatever you got on yourself. So I saw it only once. Uh, this is a whip coral with the strawberry tunicates that touch themselves, and it's pretty much in shallow water. And I like the, uh, the sun, the um, uh, ambient uh, light that goes through and light, lights up the top of the, uh, of the uh, coral and the tunicates. So this wall is called Cayo Blanco, and on top is this little tiny island. So we went on there and we got out and claimed it for ourselves and played Robinson Crusoe. Now it was on a low tide. The next day we got back, there was no island. It was covered with the water. So we're going to leave the Bay of Pigs area and go to Garden of the Queen. This is the premier diving in Cuba. It's in the south, uh, Avalon Cuban Dive Centers. They have the liveaboard boats on both locations that we were at. Um, besides the three-hour ride from where we were, it's also a three-hour ride from Havana to the little fishing village where you then either get on your liveaboard or you get in this water taxi for a three-hour boat ride out to this area, which is the largest and oldest marine park in the Caribbean. And this is the uh, Tortuga, the floating hotel that we stayed on. It's spacious, it's comfortable, has also Wi-Fi which is very unusual for any part of Cuba, and it really wasn't bad Wi-Fi. It worked fairly well. Avalon not only has Tortuga, they have four other liveaboards working in the area. With the protection, they're limited to bringing in 4,500 4, divers. 
They also have fishermen come, but because it's protected, it's catch and release fishing. So this is the premises that where they have the uh, field uh, gas station and the boats that take uh, the divers outside? Like I said, we're not diving from the liveaboard. These little boats will service all the liveaboards and Tortuga. They'll come and groups of divers will split up, get on them to the different sites. So there's many different environments in uh, Garden of the Queen, including this little cave. I was inside the cave. I used my strobes and turned the power down because I wanted to keep that dark look from the inside and have the light coming in from outside the cave. Olga was taking a photograph of the wall, so I wanted to get her silhouetted and just use the strobes to get a little bit of detail. And notice you also have air pockets uh, from our bubbles on top air area of the cave. So we did not see many shipwrecks. Actually, we saw only one small one, like this one, that was broken in large pieces and laid down on a, on a sand uh, among those big uh, coral heads. But we actually plan to come back to Cuba and go to the other side close to Santiago, and they have a lot of shipwrecks down there. But the reefs are the main thing with Garden of the Queen. So variety of hard corals and soft corals. Also anemones in this seascape. We have a grunt and a squirrel fish down at the bottom. Yellow tube sponge is well seen and pretty common also in this uh, area and stands proud on its own. Now we saw earlier some individual uh, pink vase sponges. Here we have a colony where we have at least three of them grouped together. And there's also a different uh, a sponge with uh, 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 looks like the you know with the corals it looks like it's a vase with the with the flowers. Now here we have some staghorn coral, which is rather rare. So pollution and different um, climate problems are killing a lot of the coral reefs here. So we have this very large, healthy bit of uh, staghorn. So to get the scale so we know how large it is, decided to photograph it with Olga in the background. Same with some soft coral and putting Olga to be silhouetted. And notice that her method of diving is she wears the tanks on her side and dives side mount. So it allows me to have more air on me and um, dive longer and deeper. So this is a sea weep. Um, since it's a light color, I used the faster shutter speed to make the blue color darker so that the, the, the whip will kind of stand out from the background. So here using the same uh, um, whip, I show, I put uh, Larry as the, for the scale as my model. And you can also can see that Larry dives uh, also two tanks, but it's called bent ma bent ma back, back mount because it's actually located on his back. These pillar corals, again, are very large and healthy to get the scale. Olga put me in the shot. This was a really big uh, coral. What's the depth of the reef? The depth at that point was about 80 feet. Elkhorn coral also very rare nowadays, but it's now coming back. Um, so we usually, underwater photography, we have the rule shoot up because it creates much more dramatic uh, images. So in this case, uh, I sh took the shot down because I wanted to show the, the shapes of this uh, coral. So sometimes a rule meant to be broken. This is another beautiful uh, seascape with a uh, Gorgonian fan on the back. And barrel sponge, again, proudly stands on its, on its own. Doesn't any other divers or fish. He's beautiful enough. We don't really could tell the size, but this it's was large. big, right? It was very large. And here we have another anemone with some soft corals in the background using a slower shutter speed. So this way we're getting a lighter blue background to be contrast to the foreground. So there's a good stars and beautiful stars, but also big stars like Goliath grouper. We're going to show you a few images. There was a variety of different groupers in the area. 
the Nassau grouper is much smaller. The um, Goliath groupers, well, here we have a black grouper showing his teeth. And the dentists will love this teeth to fix. So this is a, another cutie uh, Nassau grouper. As you can see, they have very prominent, powerful jaw. Another Goliath. Some of these were almost the size of Volkswagens. They're up to 600 pounds. They're big. Good dinner for the whole village. They come at you or anything? Um, the Goliaths uh, depends also on the season. If like a mating season. So those time when we came the first time, those Goliath groupers were not aggressive, but the Nasa groupers were much, much aggressive. This time they're not, the Goliath groupers were not there. They moved out, but the Nasa groupers like puppies, they followed us everywhere. They were not aggressive. So it depends on the season. This one just kept coming, wanting his photograph taken. So as you could see, they have a different pattern on the skin, Colican skin, red skin. Scales. Yeah, scales. So this is another black grouper. They're also very curious. They always come and check you out, make sure you're not a threat to the, you know, the With fishery. this one, he was under an overhang, and I decided to use a very fast shutter speed and also step down, stop down my aperture, so this way I got almost a black background. And he like, looks very hungry. So this is a rule we're talking about shooting up. And there's another group that goes up and again creates very interesting photo. This is not another NASA group hiding under the hot coral. So this one, as you could see, uh, Larry, you want to show that um, mm -hmm. little, little, we call it little fish. Uh, little cleaners. Cleaners, they come to uh, sharks and uh, groupers and they clean the skin from the parasites. So he can, once he, you can see one in the mouth, one is on the lip, yeah. one is here. So that's what they do, they clean the big fish. Also notice their lips. Olga kept saying, this is the McJagger fish. They should call it the yeah. McJagger fish. But I bet you those fish could be a fantastic boxers because you know, boxers must have you know, strong chins. So this fish could be in the ring, boxing with each other. See this prominent jaws, incredible, and the lips. They can really bite your hand off. So again, shooting up shows the bottom and so with this seascape, a lot of people feel as photographers, we should not be touching the marine life. Well, if it's a shell, maybe. Maybe some people will say not to, but my background's a studio photographer. You don't, you make things happen. So this uh, conch shell was on top of the wall and was upside down to the brown side. I picked it up, I moved it to a pretty area of the wall, I turned it over to the pink side. I got down low. I got my composition. I adjusted so I got the blue background the way I wanted it. I took a couple shots. I was just about to pick it up and place it when it was like central casting called in the, Nassau, the uh, Goliath grouper. He just kind of showed up, pulled the same angle as the wall. I jumped back down, grabbed one shot. He swam away and then I put the conch back where it was. Going on to macro photography and super macro, these callus sponges are really tiny, like what, like this. Um, a macro lens gives you a one-to-one -one life size image. In this case, Olga used a diopter on the outside of her housing on the lens port. So this way she was able to get the image even bigger than life size, which was really needed, not only for this image. And for this one, so this Blaney in the sponge that was his home, the Blaney was the size of my half of my nail, very tiny. So you have to use the after in order to take the photo of this uh, creature. Uh, using my macro lens, again, this is one of the hot corals, uh, clean fish, the one that comes and clean the uh, big uh, animals. Uh, this is a fire, fire worms. What I like about this photo, that's, it's, it's, so the fire worms actually now grows on the top of the brain uh, coral, and just the color coexists with uh, the color of the, of, of the worm, and also, the, again, the primary color, the red and the green, so it creates also interesting uh, image. And here with the colors, talking about the Christmas tree worm and the uh, hot, uh, hot uh, coral, 
come together with the same color. Lionfish are not supposed to be in the Caribbean. These are Indo-Pacific fish. They're beautiful. Their spines are poisonous. We used to have to go all the way to the other side of the world, but they've got ended up in ship bilges, and now they're all over the Caribbean. We've seen them as far north as Rhode Island. Uh, they do, they're very hardy, which is not so good. And they also don't have any predators. So they are becoming a problem, but they're still a lot of fun to photograph. I decided to shoot this one with a wide lens, get Olga in the background. I use my uh, micro 60 millimeter lens to get the headshot of this fish. Now, when you try to photograph lionfish, you expect to see a lot of their butts. They do not like come face to face because the poison is actually locates on the tail. So every time you come close, they're going to turn the tail to you. So it takes some time and patience to actually get eye to eye. Besides looking right on the reef, you need to keep your eye out into open water. We were on the reef and the school of jacks just came by rather quickly. Four eye butterfly, but, uh, butterfish, they are uh, you know, part of the cleansing uh, family that attach themselves to the big fish and clean them. Uh, you could see that the spot, we call the four eye, if, yeah, the, like on this one, on the back of the tail. So it's more like a deception to make them bigger in order to protect themselves from other bigger animals. And it's also a bennet butterfly fish, and the difference only with the patterns, because the stripes are located very differently. Queen angel fish, very pretty animal. Exquisite. Able to find, exquisite, a very exquisite. It's a good looking fish. And we have this one with a barrel sponge. Another variety of angel fish is the gray angel fish. And why is that called a gray angel because fish? Because it's a gray color. It's very simple. ID of the fish. Photographing it in a couple different ways. Yellow goat fish also comes in big schools, again, to protect themselves to be singled out and eaten. So it's the same with the pork fish. These great soap fish, this is like the second time we've seen them, and they're scattered throughout. We saw them on the Pacific when we were in Malpelo, seeing them here in Cuba, and they tend to stay right on the reef. And if you look at uh, how the head is so small, but the dolphin fish uh, fin is so large. Tarpons are very shiny. It's like photographing a giant swimming mirror. Now, we've seen tarpons before in Bonaire. They were much bigger than the ones we saw in Cuba, but they would only come out at night. Uh, these tarpons would be out during the day, and to photograph them, you would have to bring your strobe arms way out to the side and then feather your strobe heads out so only the soft edge of the light is hitting them. This way you're not getting hot spots on them. Even though they're out there in the day, you see they like the overhangs. Hawk bill uh, sea turtle uh, actually not under, under protection because very few left out in the wild. And uh, again, they also, when you try to take picture of the, of the turtle, you're going to see a lot of their butts. They swim fast, and you have to literally kind of get in the front of them and try to be able to take picture of the head. Now on this, you're almost to the front. Well, so is the other photographer in the back. Well, I'm, I'm kind of swimming on the side, trying to get in the front, and it's not easy. They are fast animals. There's also quite a number of southern stingrays. Usually you see them buried in the sand. This one decided to hang out on top. This one was buried in the sand. Our dive guide made a little commotion. I was able to grab one photograph and use the silt as the stingray swam away as a design element in the photo. And you can see how the sand kind of comes off his body in a big cloud. Now, remoras you usually see attached to sharks or groupers. We saw that one attached to a, that huge parrotfish earlier. But here we saw a number of remoras just free swimming. These two, it was shot during the day. 
I wanted to go for the graphics of what these fish looked like. I used a very fast shutter speed. I stopped the lens down. So this way, the only light is coming from my strobes, creating a black background. So he allowed to use the slow shutter speed to show the light blue color and above the our boat. And again, the scale of this, because the remote is so close, it looks like a big shark. There are many sharks in, well, not many, but few sharks in uh, these waters. And one of the nurse shark, which we only saw once because it likes to, to hide in, in, a, in a small uh, caves. Now, we want to get close to the animals to take the photographs. Uh, the sharks, everybody are scared of sharks. Well, so I think sharks are more scared of us. They're a little skittish. It's hard to get close to them. But they do like dead fish. So what we did is we would bring this box of dead fish. When we're going for silky sharks, we would hang the box. This way, we would bring the sharks right in. And you'll see a little later, we put the box on the reef to bring in. Um, the, we brought the box onto the reef to bring the sharks in. So silky sharks are fast and skittish, not easy to photograph. Notice this one is tagged. So some scientists are trying to see its whereabouts as it travels. So here I'm just swimming along the sharks and try to get the shark come close to me. Also, since we could now shoot video and stills, it's a little hard to see from this side. But mounted on the same side, you can see Olga has a strobe and a video light. And he actually, the. Uh, um the focus, focus light. light on top. If I'm in a kind of dark area, my focus light will help my camera to focus on the subject. So this is a called reef shark, very powerful, big animal. Lighting the sharks, we got to be really, really careful with strobe position. Look what we got here. We got a white underside. We're dark on the top. So when we photograph the sharks, we got to bring our strobes up a bit, have the light fall more on the dark area and cast a little bit of a shadow so we have detail in the white bottom. So now, how do we know a uh, shark going to eat us or not? Well, you have to observe their behavior. So like this shark, when you see the fins kind of drop down, it's non-aggressive mode. So you're all right. Now, Olga taking these photographs, it's almost like a studio shot. She's using the sun as a backlight. So positioning the shark into the sun ball so it's not blowing out and losing detail, but it's highlighting and creating a halo on the shark. She has her strobe arms up a little bit, so we have detail in both the dark area and the white underside. So this is another example of that uh, uh, similar uh, photo when the uh, sun bursts on the top. And again, keep your strobe arms wide open, so this way the shark will be evenly lit. And try not to overexpose. And again, it's not easy actually to make this shot when the sun bursts and the shark with a you know, lot of uh, illumination on the top and then white skin on the bottom. It's not easy, but it takes a lot of practice. Here, the sun, I didn't have the sun burst. It was a different time of day was able to still use a shutter speed to get kind of the sun draping across the water and catching the shark and our boat in the background. So here I am photographing a female pregnant shark. And again, I'm trying to be underneath and shoot up. Notice the position of her arms. They're a little bit, her strobe arms, not her arms. So the strobe arms are a little bit higher and out to the side. Here, to bring the sharks in, you don't see it. The uh, bait box is kind of buried, but it brought the sharks in, and I was able to get this image of this pregnant female. Talking about different kinds of uh, uh, photos. So Larry here used just a little bit of the uh, 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 light, strobe lights, and pretty much let the rest of the boat and the shark go as a silhouette, so which creates dramatic image. So since we dive side by side and happen to be right nearby, we took the photo of the same shark as in Ochis, but I used a different approach. I decided to use my strokes and just another image. So it don't go wrong. Either way, it's good. 
just a very majestic subject. So now, if you look at this photo, you say, hey, what lens did you guys use? Well, it's a fisheye because, as you can see, the lines are slightly uh, exaggerated and much uh, seems uh, volume size bigger. I got a lot of sharks in there, and I'm probably about eight inches away. So the fisheye allows you to come very close. So here, as you can see, I use wide angle because the lines are much linear and streamlined. So now they all jump into the aluminum box where the dead fish is. And there's a lot of competition, a lot of aggression. So at the end of the dive, we open the box, let them actually get to the fish, which turns into quite <clears throat> a commotion. As you could see, so the shark just really almost just swallowed the whole box. Here I'm not sure if the <clears throat> uh, shark got the fish or if the box got the shark. <laughs> they looked up. <laughs> So as I mentioned to you before, I sometimes use my GoPro as my plan C, and I was taking still shots. You could see my strobe was going off, and my GoPro was running at the time. And now at the moment, you could see when that feeding happened. And the shark, you see, she just mulling that uh, box. And that's my strobes. Now the lady comes on my left, and I look at that. And now she get, goes and bumped me on my head, my GoPro camera, but you will see the image I took of the shark, but without the fish because they're so fast. You wish your cameras could be as fast as the sharks, but they're not. So now Larry approached because he has a fish eye, so he needs to get much closer in order to get the, fi uh, the, the fish uh, into composition. He literally like one feet away from this crazy action. So don't do it at home, be careful. <laughs> so it's not worth you know, getting your hands chopped off. So this you. is the image I, I, I just got from, you could see the, the aluminum box right down on the bottom. She got the fish and that's the shot I got with my main camera. But the, I wish it would be that moment when she still have the fish in her mouth and drop me cold. But again, my camera is not as special as I wish. So in the mangroves, there's another interesting thing that we got in the water with. Sharks really aren't a big deal. Everybody take a look at this. So the captain uses the cloth. He kind of hits the water so I make the sounds so it will attract the crocs. So the crocs come, and I'm looking like, and now they love chicken. They love chicken more than anything else. So I'm looking at Much more than divers. So, so at least that's what we're hoping. I'm looking at those crocodiles. So do we have to really get into the water with those animals? But actually, we did. And you see, they're just munching the chicken. They just love chicken. So now we're in the water. So my main camera battery just died. So I hang my camera to the captain on the boat. And I ask him to give me my uh, Canon uh, ELF. My first camera I purchased, point and shoot camera. So Where did put, you buy that first And camera? I put it at B&H. In 2009, seven years ago, it was my first camera. In the Nikolite housing. In Nikolite housing. So both bought it bought in, uh, in BNH. So now I have only a little housing and a little camera, and I try to get some footage of the video. So this is a Larry with his big camera, and that's the way his defense weapon. I have no defense and just a little camera. So now we have a dive guide who has a pole in case if crocs attack us, he can push them away. So the croc kind of goes around me, and he sees I'm a very easy prey because I have no defense whatsoever. And now he, he got very close to me, and I could see the pole of the dive guide push him away. He said, don't touch her, she's Russian. <laughs> <laughs> There'll be political situation after that. And so he kind of pretends that he goes away from me. I'm like, well, you know, he's an easy guy. And, and that's what happened after that. He got enough of me. So you think? So I see, I'm, I'm, I'm on my hand. I don't have a pole, anything like nowadays. And uh, there's a beautiful tail, powerful tail, and that's it. He just went after me. So when that happened, I'm thinking, I sure hope Olga still has a face. But I didn't have to worry about that too long, because Olga's pretty quick. Before I knew it, she was on my back, and I had the crocodile looking at me. Because I had the camera to push him away. I didn't have anything. These are reptiles, so first you see them on the surface as they breathe. And they observe, so you see what's going on, scale out the area. So we could see Larry on the surface. It's about maybe like five, three feet of, uh, of depth. So we're snorkeling here. And that's the friendly smile at the time. 
And this is the cro crocodile that came to Larry's lens. He sees his reflection, like, who is this guy? And as you could see, so they float in mid uh, water and keep the eyes above the water. So this is the crocodile who jumped on me, and uh, he actually, I, my camera ended up in his mouth, but I was able to pull my uh, fiber optic cable fiber back. Ca yeah. It's always good to shoot vertical and horizontals, but it, this is such a strong image that Dive Magazine in the UK decided to crop Olga's photo into a vertical so they can use love, it as a cover. I love the name. They said Crocodile Rocks and another Cuban Delights. <laughs> so. They're smart animals, and so what they do to deceive you, they tilt it up because it's very fine sand down there, and this way you lose the view of them, and they will come behind you or whatever, and they kind of grab you. So this guy, as you oh can see, God. he goes through the shield, but those white teeth give him away, right? They do. I saw that. Wow. Pretty faces. We want to get close. Even when the animal subject has sharp teeth, if you want to get a good image, you have no choice to get close. I always told Olga that, but she took it a little bit to an extreme in this one. That croc was going away from me, and then suddenly he turned and jumped on me. I said, you know what, hell, I'm tough too, and we're just going to win head to head, <laughs> literally. And you see, it, actually, the captain, this is a, on the top, you kind of his white clothes. He's looking down, and there's like a lot of locomotion. But it ended up friendly, friends, and, uh, and I got the photo and got my camera back, and he swam away. It was good. So when you're on a liveaboard boat, you're doing three to four dives a day. They're feeding you well. So all you're doing is you're diving, you're eating, and you're sleeping. <laughs> so in Cuba, they do not have nitrox. We're diving air uh, pretty much for all this time, which is making us even more tired. So there you go. And on that note, we're going to end our presentation with a beautiful sunset over the Garden of the Queen. So uh, we haven't put anything together uh, with all the logistics, but we are talking about running um, underwater photo workshops in Cuba, if you would. And you could email us at the email addresses on the card, or just send it to Cuba Liquid Images UW. Dot com. We'll get the email either way so we could at least create a list of who's interested. And we hope to put something together later in 2017. Whether you're a hobbyist or a professional, BH has the answers to your questions. Experience a world of technology at our New York City Superstore. Connect with us online or give us a call. Our staff of experts is happy to help.